Okay. So what do you think? Terrible? That's what that Okay, folks. So, um, as Joe, okay. So, uh, I, I sincerely hope that you all, if you did not, for whatever reason, do the homework, I sincerely hope you go and at least uh, study the solutions because the manipulations that you were doing in that homework are, are very important. They're the kinds of things that we're going to make use of a lot, in particular these identities satisfied by the gamma matrices uh, and traces of the gamma matrices in particular. Um, and then also just working with uh, uh, equations of motion and uh, the Dirac equation in particular. Now, before I get started today, I have to admit, um, this is becoming quite a chore. Uh, I have been trying very hard to uh, stick with the convention that uh, string theorists and relativists tend to use in terms of a metric. So I remind you that we've been working with a metric where the minus is only in the first term. Don't change it. Say it again. Don't change it. Don't change it. No, I'm not going to, but what's happening is it's leading to s several mistakes that I have to then go back and correct. So for example, uh, there are two corrections that I have to make with regards to the equations of motion from last time. Um, a sign change, actually a sign change on all of them, and then a, a factor of i in the Dirac equation. So, but I'll write those equations up on the board to get started with. So let's uh, very quickly just run, go run down of what we've seen so far. So if we have a, a spin zero field, phi, then this satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation where this is the first correction. This should be minus mc over h bar squared phi equals zero. And I have to say, the sign convention that I'm using, uh, you're going to find very, very few resources that actually use it. If you want to know of a resource that uses the minus one, 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 it's uh, Steven Weinberg's books on quantum field theory, which you will find impenetrably dense. But good luck. Uh, Unfortunately, Griffith's book itself, the one I recommended for the course, is by far the most elementary account of this. It uses the one minus one minus one minus one convention. So translating results from that book uh, to what we've been using is going to be a little tricky. Um, the Dirac equation, where before I had an I out front, there is no longer an I. And again, there is a sign change. Make sure, oh wait, hold on. Uh, no, so for the Dirac equation, I actually had it as minus and I changed it to plus. Yeah, and then for spin zero, or sorry, spin one, uh, we have the Proca equation. And again, there'll be a sign change in this one, making it mc over h bar squared is equal to zero, okay? So again, these are uh, the equations that govern free spin zero, spin a half, and spin one fields. Or alternatively, if you're looking at the particle-like behavior, free spin zero, spin a half, spin a one particles, yes? So with the change we made to the Dirac equation, the trick we did in the homework to use the complex conjugate of that Dirac, like the operator, if you did DMU. So it will still work. But there's no comp. Flex, there's cuts that it will still work because you can take this and you can multiply it by the same expression with a minus, and you'll just get the difference of two squares, which is now exactly what the direct the Klein-Gordon equation is. So the, the 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 last problem in your homework was to show that the direct a solution of the direct. So let me let me review that because that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Can you rewrite the like explicitly write the f term for the spin one case? Like, what does that mean again? Because like, I'm trying to wrap my head around the... Uh, oh, what is F mu nu? So F mu nu is, by definition, uh, D mu uh, A nu minus D nu A nu. And is it always A? It's the same as that A. Yeah. 
Okay, th 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 that's, this is the definition for the simplest case. We're actually going to have to modify this when we start talking about interacting fields. But for now, that's, that's the definition we'll take for F and U, and it'll be clear when we have to make a modification. So one of the things that you were asked to show in your homework was that the Dirac equation actually secretly hides in within it the Klein-Gordon equation. And so the way that you can do that is you can just take the Dirac equation and you know you did this in your homework, but you basically split up the operator as something acting on psi. Well, if that's already equal to zero, I can multiply it by anything I want. It's still going to be zero. In particular, if I multiply it by this, Okay. Then, if I multiply this guy out, I have gamma nu, gamma mu, d nu, d mu, acting on psi. The cross terms vanish. Okay. This is the same term as this. The cross terms are generally the same. And then I get minus uh, m c over h bar squared psi equals zero. And then you. You can play a little trick, which you should have done in your homework, to see that this actually just reduces to uh, d mu, d mu psi, and that gives you the balance of the klein gordon equation. So Mark, you see where the sign yeah. sort of a, it's a, it's a double negative fixing itself with an imaginary twist. OK, <laughs> so, so secretly you found that a solution of the Dirac equation is also a solution of the Klein, or sorry, yeah, a solution of the Dirac equation is also a solution of the Klein Gordon equation. Now, you've got to be a little bit careful in how you interpret that because in, in this expression right here, psi is a four component spinner, right? Because it, it's from the Dirac equation. However, in this expression, what Dirac matrices are present? What spin space matrices are present? Well, there has to be something because this is a four component object. The identity. Yeah, the identity, but that's trivial. So what that means is that this equation has to be true for each component of psi individually. So what you showed <laughs> in your homework was actually that each of the four components of this Dirac spinner satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. You can't say that each component of the Dirac spinner obeys the Dirac equation because this term right here mixes up the components because gamma mu is not the identity, it's something more complicated. All right? Okay, so um, you might think, well, that's just an oddity, you know. Klein Gordon good, Dirac gooder. But it turns out that the same thing happens here, okay? So if we take this equation and we simply act with uh, a d nu on the whole equation, okay, if, if something's equal to zero, I can do anything I want to it and it'll remain zero. So if I act on this with d mu or d nu, I get something that looks like that. Okay, if I expand out what f is, well, first of all, even before I expand it out, if I interchange mu and nu in a partial derivative, does that do anything? Can I always interchange partial derivatives? Yes. If I interchange mu and nu in f, does that do anything? Yeah, what does it do? It introduces a minus sign. So what we have here, and this is a very important uh, lesson from index manipulation of tensors, is we have a, a symmetric tensor that is fully contracted with an anti-symmetric tensor. And the result of that, and you can literally just write out the components, the result is that it's trivially zero. Okay. So you, you can take my word for it now that you can just literally write out, you know, pick all the different values, 0, 1, 2, 3, write down all the terms, and you'll see that for every one there's a negative contribution and they all, they all cancel. Okay. So, so this is 0 by construction, but that then means that this 
to zero. Okay? Does that make sense? One term is zero and the whole thing is zero, the other term has to be zero. Okay? However, now let's write this thing out. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Let's write out the original equation. Yeah, this guy. <coughs> so let's actually write out what this is. This is d mu, d mu a mu minus d mu a mu minus mc over h bar squared a mu equals zero. If I take this guy and I scoot him on the other side of that guy, what happens to that term? So if I move this d mu over here to act on this a mu, that's zero, okay? And then what I'm left with, so this goes away, and then what I'm left with is exactly d mu, d mu, a mu minus mc over h bar squared a mu equals zero. Anybody recognize that? Anybody recognize that? That's the klein gordon equation, again. Okay? Where it holds for each component of a mu. So just like the Dirac equation was secretly hiding the klein gordon equation, so too is the Proca equation hiding the, 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 the klein gordon equation. So what I would like to do is try and sort of unearth why this is the case. Like, why is the klein gordon equation hiding everywhere? And moreover, what additional information does the Dirac and the Proca equations give to us? Okay, they clearly have to say a little something more than klein gordon Otherwise, we would just use klein gordon for everything. Yes? Um, the equation you just wrote, could we have argued that Could we have argued uh, so that d mu d mu a mu? Can we argue that that's a scalar just by notation right now? So this is a scalar. Yeah. So then we could just say that the, the partial of that would just be zero. Uh, the, 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 the scalar does not have to have a diminishing derivative. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. I mean that's the gradient of a scalar field is, is basically the d mu of the scalar. Just because it's a scalar, that just means it doesn't transform, doesn't mean it's constant. Okay, okay are there any other uh, <coughs> questions about this, sort of these manipulations? Because now what I want to do is I kind of want to give an interpretation of what you're seeing. Yes? So regarding your sign change, um, yeah. would those all come up if you put the difference convention for the metric into the derivation? Absolutely, so everything so if we go back and restore an i here, make that a minus, make that a plus, and make that a plus, it all works out, but the other big change, and this is where it gets to be a real pain in the ass, is the gamma matrices are different. You wouldn't change this argument, because this didn't really require looking at the specific form of the gamma matrices, but a lot of what I'm about to say re requires looking at the specific form of the gamma matrices. So, so Yes, this argument would follow through just making those changes, and you can kind of see that pretty quickly, but a lot of the other details uh, require that extra change, and that's where it becomes really tricky because the gamma matrices look very different. They're not just a different by a minus sign. They're actually diagonal in one situation and not diagonal in the other, and so it's a real change, yeah. So which convention are we sticking with? We're, we're sticking with the one we've been sticking with, which is, I, I don't know if there's actually a name for it. Uh, the, the classic uh, convention that's used in the Griffiths textbook is the Bjorken and Drell uh, convention, but we're not using that. I don't know if there's a name for this one. It's the Weinberg, it's the one that Weinberg uses, so. Oh, minus one in time? The, well, the, well, the name of that convention is, I think, sometimes called the West Coast Convention. 
because physicists on the East Coast more often use 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1, and physicists on the West Coast use minus 1, 1, 1, 1. But I, I don't know if there's a name for it. They're all, they're just conventions. So let me, let me not get hung up on that. It's just a, it's a convention. I don't care what its name is, but it's what we're using. So minus 1, 1, 1, 1 is what we're using. With the gamma matrices as I've given them to you, yes. Is it easier to see certain types of phenomena come out when you almost see the Yeah, and that's a that's kind of a shameful part of having gone with the convention that I went with is some of the arguments I'm gonna make today are gonna not be as clear as they could have been. And that's what that's part of the reason why Griffiths uses the convention he does is some of the arguments are very clean and it's mainly because gamma zero is diagonal. And you'll see where that would have been an advantage in the course of our discussion today. But, it, but it, it's all convention. None of the physical results that you calculate are going to change. That's, that's a given. Okay. So, um, so let, me, let me continue on a little bit and see if we can um, get some idea of why we should be expecting uh, these things to pop up. And I'm going to start with kind of giving the Klein-Gordon equation itself an interpretation. And um, what I want to do is consider a very robust result from relativity. Okay, something that we sort of expect to be true for anything, whether it's a scalar, spinner, vector, whatever. And that is the mass shell condition. So the mass shell condition, and this is where I'm probably gonna have to get my sign changes uh, made on the fly. I think I can do this. Okay. The mass shell condition we know reads uh, that, but a better way to think of this is that if I square the four momentum, that's equal to minus m squared c squared. Okay. Remember, this is not the square of the four momentum. This is minus the square of the four momentum because I should have a negative here and a positive there for p v p mu, and that's again our convention. All right. So what I can do is I can take this expression and I can just write a little equation, p mu p mu minus plus m squared c squared equals zero. And that is, that is just the mass shell relationship. It is sort of a, a built in, it's built into the framework of special relativity. Okay, it wasn't something that we had to stick in by hand. It just it comes out of the framework of working with four dimensional Lorentz invariant theories. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend like I want to play quantum mechanics with this. And if I want to play quantum mechanics with this, what I can do is replace the momentum by I h bar partial with respect to mu. Okay, and that might look suspicious or suspiciously familiar, and I'll, I'll make a connection to something you're very familiar with in just a minute. But if I do that, and I plug it into this expression, and then I let this expression act on something. So this is now an operator. It's a derivative. It's got to der derivitate something. <laughs> okay. So if I plug that in, then I'm going to have uh, I squared minus, so minus uh, H bar squared D mu, D mu, and I might as well just let it act on something called phi, just for shits and giggles. And then this is going to be plus m squared c squared phi equals zero. Well, holy crap. Anybody recognize that? That's the Klein Gordon equation. <laughs> now, you might go, wait a minute, Flournoy, can you really do that? Well, let me actually, uh, let's look at it in a non relativistic context. So, in non relativistic context, instead of that mass energy relationship. And I want to bear in mind, this energy here, when I refer to energy in the mass shell condition, that's the total kinetic energy. It's not potential energy. Okay? We haven't even talked about potential energy in, in this class or relativity. Okay? And we're not really going to talk about potential so much. We're just going to talk about interactions. But in the non-relativistic case, I know that if I want to define the energy of a system, the total energy, the relationship to momentum is just that. And if I want to throw in a potential, I can. Okay, a potential energy. 
So classically, we're comfortable with this expression, right? This is secretly one half mv squared. We teach this to the little kids in Physics 100. And we learn it when we teach to them, okay? But now, let's play the exact same game. Let's take momentum and replace it by minus i h bar, the gradient operator. And you might say, wait a minute, is that the same thing that you did here? Yes. Well, it actually is. Okay. And let's replace the energy with I H bar d by dt. Of course, the difference in signs that you're seeing here are because of the metric. Time is a different sign than spatial parts. But if I take these assignments and plug them into this energy expression, I get minus h bar squared over 2m del squared on, let's just let it act on something called psi, plus d psi is i h bar d psi dt. <coughs> you know, recognize that? It's a Schrodinger equation. Okay, so we're really not doing anything different than what you would do to get the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation from the sort of non-relativistic definition of energy. Now, what you do with the Schrodinger equation is radically different than what we're going to do with these equations. This is acting on a wave function. That wave function describes particle. This is acting on a field. Okay, so these are very, very deep. These mean very, very different things. We're doing field theory. This is what you would do if you wanted to do quantum mechanics with one particle. We can get particles out of this, but it requires extra work. But I'm just kind of arguing that we're in, in spirit doing the same sorts of steps, okay? So now that we kind of have an idea of where the Klein-Gordon equation is sort of coming from, hopefully now, it's intuitive why the Klein-Gordon equation appears everywhere. Because after all, I don't care what your spin is. If your field is going to describe a particle of any sort, and that particle is going to be moving with some energy E and some momentum P, they have to satisfy this relationship. They have to satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. And sure enough, we've demonstrated that in all three cases, they do. Okay. So that's sort of part one of this little journey. Why is the Klein-Gordon equation everywhere? Part two, of course, is the more interesting one, which is, okay, what more do these equations give us than Klein-Gordon? Again, if it, was, if it was all just Klein-Gordon, I wouldn't need these. I would just use the Klein-Gordon for everything and be done. But clearly, this, the Dirac equation and the Proca equation, they have something more. And, and by the way, and I'll go back and correct the notes, all of these sign changes I made here have to go back into the Lagrangians in appropriate corrections, okay? So I'll go back and correct the notes and re-upload them. But uh, in connecting these equations in motion to the Lagrangians that we talked about, you've got to go back and make some, some changes. Okay, so are there any questions about this argument before we move on to what more we have? Okay. Um, all right. Just erase something I wanted to keep. But that's fine. You do that a lot. Yeah, I do that a lot. Yeah, it's just it's just the way I it's the way I roll. All right. So um, to to talk about what we're what we're actually getting out of these additional equations over and above Pine Gordon, we're going to have to take a sort of a, a a a pause and think about things in sort of a, a meta level. And unfortunately. The discussion that we're about to have is not a discussion where I have seen any consensus on the language used. So I'm going to throw some ideas out there. And you're welcome to, to question me, but it's, I'm not guaranteed that I'm going to be able to answer the questions. Because truthfully, I can't find consensus on when people use certain words exactly what they're meaning. And you'll probably get an idea of what I'm talking about as the discussion rolls out. So um, what I'm going to talk about for a bit is degrees of freedom. And there are different ways that you can 
that you can define what you mean by degree of freedom. And this is one of those words which I can't get consensus on. But, uh, but anyway, so if we, have a, if we have a particle that is just sort of free to move in d dimensions, then one way to define the degrees of freedom of that particle is the dimension of the configuration space of the particle. That is, the dimension of the space of positions of that particle. So if the particle's moving in 3D, then I would expect this to have three degrees of freedom. Okay, it can move in X, Y, and Z, three independent degrees of freedom. Another way to define it, which might actually sound silly, but actually turns out to be useful, um, is that it's either the number, it's either the dimension of configuration space, or it's half the dimension of phase space. If you've encountered phase space, and if you haven't, it's fine. You don't really need to understand this for the purposes of this, of this class. But if, if you've encountered phase space, normally phase space, if you have a free particle moving in three dimensions, phase space is the three coordinate positions it can have and then the three components of its velocity. So the phase space is basically a six-dimensional space with axes x, y, z, v, x, v, y, v, z. Okay, and, face, and thinking of things in phase space, and in particular plotting motion in phase space is actually a very interesting exercise, particularly when you're studying things like nonlinear systems. But, but, but clearly, if I have six, I get back three. Okay. Now the reason why this is actually useful is because sometimes the definition of phase space isn't as, isn't as obvious as just take the position and add on the three components of velocity. Right? And it turns out for the Dirac equation, that's actually one case where it's not trivial because if you want to define the, the velocity or the momentum of, of a field in the Dirac equation, the usual prescription is if you have a Lagrangian, you take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of the field and that defines the canonical momentum. But in, for the Dirac equation, that leaves you with psi bar being the canonical momentum to psi instead of d mu psi. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's the detail. We're not going to go over, we're not going to do it that way, so, so I just want to, if you, if you start looking at degrees of freedom and you look at the Dirac equation counting the degrees of freedom, this is one argument that you'll see posed, all right? But I'm going to use a slightly different one. Yeah? Uh, just a quick question, can phase space ever have an odd number of, uh, so like, it's always half, so can you ever have like a three and a half dimensional configuration space because you have an odd number of phase space? Uh, well, um, yeah, so you can, so you can define, and, well, I, I'm actually not an expert on this. Maybe some of Lincoln's students want to pipe up, but you can <laughs> certainly define spaces with fractal dimension. That in and of itself you can define. Whether you can define dynamics on fractal spaces is a separate question. But if you could, then you would have a configuration space of fractional dimension, which would lead to an odd or maybe even weirder fractional phase space. But I'm not sure. Mark. You can, uh, like, the phase space won't be fractional, but you can have, like, a particle in, like, in a chaotic system confined to a portion of phase space that's of fractional dimension. But when you talk about a particle in phase space, it's always going to be a unique dimension yeah. based on the way it's defined. Okay, but I don't want to get hung up on this because this is not the way we're going to do the counting anymore. Okay. So, um, so, so for fields, um, this actually, this argument becomes a little bit weirder because if we have a field instead of a particle, in principle, even if we have a scalar field, the simplest kind of field, we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom because to specify the field, we have to give you the field value at every location. We have to give you what phi is at each and every position. So immediately in field theory, the number of degrees of freedom is a little bit bigger than it is for a point particle. Okay, three goes to infinity. <clears throat> but fortunately, and this is probably relatively intuitive, if you know the number of degrees of freedom of the field at a single point, then it's the same number of degrees of freedom at any other point. So if I, if I have a finite number of degrees of freedom at a given point, then the total is just that number of degrees of freedom times the number of points, 
which is again infinity, but, but the real useful quantity is how many degrees of freedom are there at a point, okay? So that's what we're really interested in, in talking about when we talk about field theory. So we're, we're looking for a finite number even though the, the honest, naive answer would be infinity. Now, Um, the, so if I have a field and I think of, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a lot of switching between field language and particle language but because your experience of thinking about a lot of what we're going to talk about has been in terms of particles. So I want to kind of make it as familiar as possible. We're doing field theory, but remember at the end of the day, if this is my field phi, then if I take a solution for phi, say the trivial solution zero, that solves almost all these equations of motion, and then I expand about that in small fluctuations, these small fluctuations, which ostensibly represent particles, will satisfy the same equations of motion. So these equations of motion govern the fields themselves, but they also govern small fluctuations of the fields. So I can kind of walk back and forth between field, what's happening with the field, and what's happening with particles in this description. So a particle moving in space-time, we already know is going to be represented by some non-trivial field configuration. The field, as it varies in space-time, is already describing the motion of the particle for us. Okay, so this is, I'm talking about the overall motion of the particle. I'm not asking about, you know, what is its spin doing or anything like that. Just this thing is moving, moving this fast. Okay, but that is what the Klein-Gordon equation should be describing for us. So the Klein-Gordon equation is going to be, is going to determine for us or restrict or, or uh, um, or limit the number of degrees of freedom, or, or sorry, it's going to uh, uh, determine for us, through solving the Klein-Gordon equation, uh, the form of the degrees of freedom associated with the field varying from point to point. Okay? Yeah? So what's the mass in all this equation referring to? So it's, it's, it's technically the mass of the field, but it actually automatically corresponds to the mass of a, <coughs> of a particle a, a interpreted in terms of the fluctuation of the field. That's not entirely obvious, but it couldn't really be anything else. So the, the, the mass of a field itself doesn't mean very much, right? Because fields are infinite, so what, what does the mass mean? But we also never really think about taking the entire field and exciting it all at once, because that would require an infinite amount of energy. And by the way, almost everything that I'm saying completely changes if you look at non-trivial field configurations, like solitonic field configurations and so forth. So we're looking at really trivial field configurations that are not these perturbations, but don't worry about those words. Um, <laughs> okay, so the question now is, the Klein-Gordon equation describes sort of just motion, and we really see that in the E squared minus P squared, or, you know, and that it represents just the natural condition. But now we can ask ourselves, okay, what if this particle also has intrinsic spin? We also have to describe the spin state of the particle. Okay, so in addition to just knowing what the motion of the particle is in space-time, we want to know what that spin state is, how that spin state is evolving. And it turns out that describing the spin state is exactly what these two equations bring into the story over and above what we get from the Klein-Gordon. Okay, so let's see uh, some details of how that plays out. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna very quickly, if I can, run through. Oh my goodness, um, run through a, a really pretty argument. It's gonna give you the. Uh, the skeleton of it because it's actually very. It's actually deeply group theoretic. <laughs> 
It's actually uh, quite deeply group theoretic to prove it, but you're welcome to go and look up Wigner's classification theorem, and, and if you've ever encountered the name Wigner in a quantum mechanics class, you automatically know it's group theory. But uh, um, be it the Wigner Eckert theorem or anywhere else Wigner shows up. But anyway, uh, you can also look up what's called induced representations. Um, it's part of the same argument. But, but the Wigner classification theorem basically, um, in the physics context, goes something like this. Um, if we have a particle that's moving, specifying its momentum, okay, is a specification of all of the degrees of freedom that you kind of expect from Klein Gordon. Okay, you're saying it's it's here and it's moving, you know, with some with some speed in this direction. And you, know, you tack that with the mass and it's got uh, you got a four momentum. Now Once you've specified the four momentum of a particle, the question then is, what do you have left to specify? What else is there? It turns out if you have a scalar particle, you're done. Because once you know its four momentum, that's it. That's all there is. Okay? But if you have some internal structure, you also have to specify what's going on with the internal structure. However, in choosing the in what's going on with the internal structure, you don't want that to change the form momentum. So the question is, once we've specified form momentum of something, how much freedom do we have left to play around with? Okay. Now, the, the powerful part of this argument, and the, and the part that I'm not going to, to reproduce here, is that this argument goes through in any frame. I'm not going to do it in any frame. I'm going to do it in the easiest frame. Okay. So let's consider looking at the four momentum in the rest frame of a particle. Okay. So if I'm in the rest frame of a particle, I know the four momentum is MC000. And the question is, what am I allowed to do to that? that leaves that vector, not the magnitude of the vector, but the vector itself unchanged. So what set of transformations can I do on it? Yeah, I can do spatial rotations because those are all zero. So spatial rotations leave this thing invariant. Okay. I can't do boosts because boosts will generally change the time entry, and, and you'll also typically pick up a spatial entry. Okay, but in, with that form, I can I can do any spatial rotation I like. Okay. Well, we know how to describe spatial rotations, at least in terms of vectors. Those are the SO3 transformations. Okay. What's not obvious is that even if you weren't in the rest frame, so even if you picked a different vector. you would still be left with not three spatial rotations, but a group of transformations that is isomorphic to this. Proving that is hard, okay? And it's beyond what we've got the tools to do, okay? But, but let me say it this way. If I'm counting degrees of freedom, it really shouldn't matter what frame I'm doing the counting in, because one thing special relativity tells us is that if you do it in one frame, then you should get the same answer as another frame for physically meaningful questions. And the number of degrees of freedom is definitely physically meaningful. So we can, if we can do the counting in one simple frame and get an answer, that should be the same answer in any other frame, even though it might be much harder to prove it than it turns out to be. But again, if you want to see the proof in an arbitrary frame, you can look up Wigner's classification terms. Okay, so why is this important? It's important because the internal degrees of freedom, the things we have left to specify, are essentially rotations in three dimensions. But rotations in three dimensions is what you study when you study non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Right? You didn't do four dimensions. You didn't have boosts in time. You just focused on three space and transformations in three space. Okay? So in particular, the things that I can specify 
that don't change the overall four momentum are essentially three-dimensional spatial angular momentum. I don't have to do some really weird four-dimensional interpretation of angular momentum because the degrees of freedom that are left over are just analogs of spatial angular momentum. So with that in mind, everything you know about angular momentum from quantum mechanics, and I'm talking about even the stuff you saw in modern physics, okay, certainly stuff you see in 320, all of that stuff we can immediately carry over to these relativistic settings. Okay, so let's, let's review some of this. And most of what I'm about to say should be familiar to you. So angular momentum in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, first of all, one of the interesting things about angular momentum in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, angular momentum, be it orbital angular momentum, spin angular momentum, I don't care, um, they are always discrete. Okay? What about linear momentum? <clears throat> Is linear momentum discrete in quantum mechanics? Not inherently, no. Not necessarily, right? It can be continuous or discrete. This idea that everything is discrete in quantum mechanics is a bunch of baloney. It depends on the situation, okay? So linear momentum can be continuous or discrete. Can somebody give me an example of when it's continuous? A free particle. Like an electron. You gotta, you gotta add something to it. So that no potential is free particle. Free particle in in free space always. So if I have a if I have a two dimensional if I have a if I have a particle moving around a ring, well that's not if if the space it's living on is circular. So then that's if the space exactly and it's discrete. Yeah. Okay. Good. So so. A particle moving in an infinite dimension with no interaction has a continuous spectrum. To get a discrete spectrum, I just I put it in a box or I give it periodic boundary conditions. Okay. Why is angular momentum always discretized? Does anybody know? Say it again? Sure. Well, I mean, well, ang orbital angular momentum is also always discretized. So the non-commutativity is part of it. It's actually how you can derive it without knowing the, the more uh, elementary underlying reason, which is what I'm getting at. There's no way of like, you define like, uh, angular momentum of like R and cross. So that's the same, that, that, that you can use to show that it doesn't mute. Okay, so this is a point which I feel like never gets really made to you in quantum mechanics, and it's kind of a shame. When you're looking at quantum mechanical, when you're looking at quantum systems and you're asking, <coughs> is it going to be discrete or continuous? The question is, you have a transformation that you do, and is the parameter of that transformation compact or not? So if I take a particle on the x-axis and I allow it to translate by a arbitrary amount, which from, goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, then the momentum of that particle is continuous. The minute I confine the particle to, say, a box from 0 to L, the translations are anywhere from 0 to L. It's a finite range. The momentum is quantized. It's discrete. Angular momentum is associated with rotations. Rotations always have a finite parameter, 0 to 2 pi. So is it then like the transformations under which that's symmetric define what type of continuous or non-continuous? It doesn't necessarily have to be a statement about symmetry. Okay, I don't want to say that there's translational invariance in a particle in a box per se, because you could definitely be closer to the edge. That's a that's that gets us into a slightly more refined discussion of symmetry and the the aspect of spontaneous symmetry breaking. But but generally we're thinking here about you've got some transformation and there's always some momentum associated with it. 
Angular momentum is associated with rotations, linear momentum is associated with translations. And the question is just how far can you do it? What's, what's the range of the parameters? Is it infinite or is it... <coughs> so I, I can understand how that argument would work with translational momentum, linear momentum, or angular momentum, but it doesn't seem like there's an, an analogous argument for spin. So spin is definitely associated with rotations. It's not, it's not a physical object rotating, but by all of our accounts of, of the behavior of particles attributed to their spin degree of freedom, we should be identifying it as some kind of rotational property of the particle. I'm not saying it's a classical version of a wall spinning, but it is definitely tied to rotations. I mean, in particular, it's always quantized. I mean, we've never yeah. seen an example of... Why, why does the parameter set being compact force anything on the So, so really guys, guys, the guys this is, I don't want to get hung up on this discussion because at some level you should have learned this in quantum mechanics and it pisses me off that your teachers don't teach you what you should know, but this is the, this is the simple way to, to think about it, Martin. If I give you a wave and I let that wave, I give you a wave equation in an infinite plane and I ask you what frequencies can you stick in there, you have no boundary conditions. You can put in any damn frequency you want. But the minute I put boundary conditions and I ask you solve the wave equation, then you, you can only put certain frequencies in. It's discretized. And it's all about this. Okay? Yeah. All right. Don't, don't go complain to your quantum teacher about what I said. I don't want to get going. Okay. Um, so, oh gosh, where am I? Um, oh yeah. Okay. So, um, so angular momentum is angular, so the, the point here is spin angular momentum, which is the thing I have left to describe in terms of these degrees of freedom, it's always quantized. There is no continuous version of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. We're doing quant a quantum mechanical theory eventually, so I'm just not gonna, I'm gonna go straight to the quantum mechanical version of angular momentum. There's just no point in even thinking about, you know, continuous anything. So uh, the, the quantum mechanical version of angular momentum says, um, if the spin is, and I'm writing twiddle zero, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute. If the total spin is zero, then the z component of the spin, if I just pick an axis and I look at the component of the spin along that axis, the z component of the spin is necessarily zero. If it's a uh, spin a half, then it's plus or minus one half h bar, and if it's spin one, then it's uh, plus one, zero, or minus one h bar, okay? Technically, the spin, we don't really talk about spin so much as spin squared. This is the operator that actually commutes with SZ, and the spin squared value, if you did a measurement of it, would return S times S plus one, where S is zero, one half or one times h bar squared, and just to make sure your quantum teacher's taught you something correct, you'll notice that s squared is necessarily larger than s z squared. Everybody see that? If I have spin a half, s z squared is h bar squared over four, but this is bigger than that, three fourths h bar squared. Okay. Does anybody know why that's the case? Exactly. Good. If the if, if all the spin was in the z direction, then that would mean s x and x y were zero, which would mean you've magically known all three components of spin, which we know you can't do. Okay. All right. So what I'm more interested in, though, is this idea here, that for a spin zero state. We essentially have, you could call it zero or one degree of freedom, it doesn't really matter, but here we have two states, or what I'm gonna to refer to as two degrees of freedom, and this is where the language gets really murky if you go out there and look. Um, I'm gonna call these degrees of freedom even though it's kinda of hard to wrap your head around why you would say they're degrees of freedom. You certainly, for a spin a half particle, have the freedom of choosing it to be spin up or spin down. So you have sort of a discrete degree of freedom that can take one of two values. And here, of course, we have three. Okay, 
Now the reason I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on that counting is because this is part of why we're going to, or what we're going to extricate from these two equations as to what they're telling us over and above the Klein Gordon equation. So um, is there anybody who's like stumped by this, haven't seen it before? Yes? Just a question. So for the spin zero, are you getting zero degrees of freedom or one? Um, let's say there's, there's no additional degrees of freedom. You do not have to specify the spin state. So I, I might just call that no additional degree of freedom. I mean, the particle can move, so I don't want to yeah, say it has no degrees of freedom. Yeah, we're talking about yeah. Is the uh, is the spin uh, S Z is zero like how is that different from when S is zero S Z is zero? Or is that something that's completely different? So so this this having S Z equals zero, you have to remember S squared is not zero for this. So if I have a if I have a vector, I can certainly pick it so that it's has zero Z component. But that's definitely different than saying there's no vector. This is like saying there's no vector. This is like saying I've got a vector, but it happens to be in the xy plane, so it has zero z component. Okay. All right, so let's take, as the simpler example, uh, the Proca equation, which earlier we showed is equivalent to the Klein Gordon equation for A nu, okay, plus one other equation. Right, it turns out that you can you can work you can work backwards. You could take these two equations as the equations defining a the behavior of A nu. And you can combine them to say, all right, it also satisfies this. Okay? But let's ask what this is doing. This is saying, okay, the particle can move, and if it moves and has energy and momentum, it's got to satisfy the mass shell condition. That's what the Klein Gordon equation tells us. This is the only new information. What new information is this telling us? Well, it's telling us this quantity A new which is not a scalar, but a four-component object, that quantity we would expect to have four degrees of freedom. It's got four things. Four things to specify. But it's spin one. So by this Victor classification theorem, the only thing you have to specify corresponds to the angular momentum states for three-dimensional rotations. So we're having this weird thing where we've got a four-component vector because of relativity, but we should only be getting three components or, or the degrees of freedom associated with spatial rotations, non-relativistic rotations. So somehow I have to take these four independent things and remove one of them. Well, how can I do that? I just write an equation a single equation that they have to satisfy. And there it is. So this removes one of the four degrees of freedom, leaving the three expected. So all the Proca equation is doing is it's taking the, the, the Klein-Gordon equation and it's saying, well, but you're a four-component object secretly, but you're not supposed to be four components. You're really just supposed to be three, so let's get rid of one. Okay? Yes? So could we say that we're thinking outside the box? <laughs> okay, so um, with that in mind, <laughs> uh, that, that's me explicitly ignoring you, Matt. Um, okay. So with that in mind, the question then is, what might we expect for the Dirac equation? Yeah, exactly. So for the Dirac equation, if the Dirac equation is, is, is describing spin a half, then the Dirac equation should leave us with two degrees of freedom after we've sort of removed the Klein-Gordon, okay? Unfortunately, the story for the Dirac equation doesn't look like this at all. It doesn't play out nearly as nicely. But it plays out much more interestingly. 
And I'm just going to try and fly through this part, and next time we'll have to actually look at explicit solutions. So if I take the Dirac equation, all right, and again, I, I want to, it's easier to think in terms of momentum, because I can say, oh, it's at rest, therefore the momentum has this form. So I'm going to write this in, in a momentum space representation. So I do the same thing. I replace P mu with uh, I H bar B mu. And then this guy is going to become, oh lord, I got a minus in there that I'm not supposed to have. this looks like in the rest frame. Okay, again, let's just kind of use this, this, this motivation of the Wigner classification theorem, pick the easiest frame, and then try and identify what degrees of freedom are left over. So in the rest frame, P mu, now this is the dual momentum, it's a lower index, so this is minus MC, zero, zero, zero. And if I plug that in here, then I'm going to get I gamma zero, MC psi plus MC psi. which is just I gamma zero plus one acting on psi equals zero. The MC appears everywhere. Okay, so pull it out. You might say, wow, that's the coolest thing you've ever written in your entire life. Oh, my. Awesome. But this thing is actually special. Because if I take it, What's gamma zero squared? Negative, negative, or sorry, this would be one. This gamma zero squared is negative one, so this becomes plus one, and overall this becomes two, I gamma zero plus one. Anybody I recognize that sort of behavior? Say it again? Well, these are, these, are, these are actually things that act on things. So these are what, in, in quantum parlance, you call operators. It's a projection operator. <coughs> projection operators, by definition, satisfy that if you do the operation twice, you get back to the original thing. This has got a non-trivial normalization, but the, the operator part of it is what you want to look at, okay? So if I act with I gamma zero plus one twice, it's basically the same thing as acting with I gamma zero plus one once. So the Dirac equation in the rest frame is a projection. It's just a projection on this spinner. So a projection takes you from a larger space down to a smaller subspace. That's what projection operators do. So let's ask, what are we projecting out? So let's see what we start with. How many components should we naively think, how many independent parameters do we naively think should be inside? It's complex. It's a complex four component spinner, that means eight real parameters. We have to get down to two. Okay. You're only projecting under the zero space-time dimensions. You only take one component of it, right? 
Well, it, it, that we're, that we're doing things only on the zero component is just a virtue of working in the rest frame, but remember the result is independent of the frame. So the number of degrees of freedom I get in the rest frame are the same in any yeah, other frame. Yeah. That's not obvious and intuitive. If you agree with relativity, it's at least should be the case. So, so we have a projection operator that is projecting the eight parameters here down to some subspace of parameters, and our hope is that these eight parameters go down to two, right? It doesn't. Okay. Okay. This projection operator removes four components. It only halves the number. Okay. Now, you can go back to that argument that I was making earlier about that the degrees of freedom correspond to half the dimension of phase space. And that's the quickest argument to see that the Dirac equation is only removing half of the original degrees of freedom of psi. But again, there were eight, so we're getting four. So you might ask yourself, is all this just for shit? Are we screwed? Probably, yes. And the answer is no, because what the Dirac equation is describing for us is the spin up and spin down states of both particles and antiparticles. And had we enough time for me to actually give you the solutions to the Dirac equation, we can make that connection, but that's what we'll start with next.